Well, praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. What a beautiful day this is. The sky is blue where we are at, as I'm looking out there. And uh, today I'm going to impart a powerful, powerful way of discipling. And when you disciple this way, like Jesus, it is going to bring life to you. This is life changing. So let's give God all the praise. And let's get right into it. This is life changing. This is everyday life stuff. Let's just uh, have a scripture there. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. And then I'm just going to begin to share with you daily life uh, experiences and the way how to handle different things like Jesus, the perfect way to disciple. In uh, Philippians 2, uh, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let this mind also be in you, that was in Christ Jesus. Today, I just want to have a chat about how did Jesus handle opposition? How did Jesus handle daily life challenges? And that's the best way of discipling. It starts all with having the mind of Christ. God bless you, Ted. God bless you. Having the mind of Christ. The attitude of Christ will determine the altitude of your influence. I'm going to say that again. The attitude of Christ will determine the altitude of your influence. Let's look at practical examples. Jesus, as the Christ, is at crossroads in his life. Now he disciples. I mean, he reaches his hometown and his family wanting him to come and eat. And there's this huge crowd and he goes about ministering to the crowd. His family got so mad. <laughs> they said, he is running mad. And he was at a crossroad. He could have allowed the influence of those words to either detour him, affect him, but he didn't. He released the Father's heart and the Father's compassion. On another occasion, Jesus is uh, busy ministering and the crowd says, some of them says, uh, your father or your mother and your brothers, your mother and your brothers, uh, they're looking for you in today's life, your parents, however. It says they're looking for you. How did Jesus disciple? Jesus answered and he said, my mother, my brothers, and so on and so forth are those who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus, his attitude, he allowed his mind to dwell in heavenly places. Whilst his feet was walking in the earth realm with a physical body, with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit on the inside of him. He allowed his mind to dwell on or in heavenly places. Jesus, when he was discipling, 
The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way. For no man can come unto the Father except through me. So let's look at his ways of daily discipling as well. Through challenges. Jesus, he's busy casting out devils. And some religious fanatics that are legalistic labeled him as demon-possessed. Has anyone ever thrown insults at you? I know what it is. Jesus did not allow that accusation to reduce his effectiveness of reaching more people. And he continued to cast out demonic spirits. Then they said, oh, he is demon-possessed. Uh, you know, uh, he's, uh, he's Belzebub. And Jesus refuted that accusation through an uh, attitude from his father and he, and he basically explained to them Jesus never reacted when you disciple people it's not just sitting down with books and discipling them our lifestyle should disciple people our lifestyle so what did Jesus do? he explains to them he says, uh, you know, any kingdom that's divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan cast out Satan, you're calling me Belzebub, demon possessed, and in your eyes, I'm like a demon casting out devils. And so, uh, God bless you. Uh, uh, who is that? Let me put on my glasses here. A shiny Millie, God bless you, and Tat, and I know my wife is listening. These are powerful, practical examples how Jesus discipled. And uh, Jesus basically responded, and he says, Any kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. How can Satan cast out Satan? And Jesus moved on. When Jesus discipled people, it was not just getting books. And I tell you, I've got books and books. I can just pull out books here. There's another book here on discipling. Uh, there's a, I mean, I can just pull out books. You'll, you'll find books all over here. Because I, I'm a, a learner. I keep learning. And of course, through the Word of God. Every book of mine must back up uh, or must agree or go along with scripture all right back to the practical discipling so here's jesus he calls 12 disciples to himself discipling means that jesus is uh, a way a discipler needs to be with the disciples and there needs to be close connection contact Jesus was a mentor, not a tormentor. Jesus had much anointing and not much annoying inside of him. So Jesus calls the 12 disciples to him. He's now discipling a group. Now watch. Are you ready? He's now discipling. So there is Judas. And Judas was going to betray Jesus. And according to scripture, Jesus knew because at communion, he said, one of you who dips his hand into the bowl is the one who will betray me. And then he will address Judas and say, go and do what you need to do. We all need a Judas in our lives. I'm going to say that again. 
We all need a Judas in our lives. A Judas will cause you and I to go to where? To Calvary. A Judas will cause us to go to the cross. Because the cross speaks of three things. Redemption, Jesus who redeemed us from the curse of the law of sickness, death, hell, and poverty. And by shedding his blood, the one thief rejected Jesus and the other thief received Jesus, the three R's, the three R's. Jesus understood that though he was being betrayed or about to be betrayed, he knew that he had to go to Calvary. He did not treat the person who betrayed him with disrespect. In fact, he kept G uh, uh, Judas even up to that last minute. At, uh, at the communion table. Let me just uh, share this as well with you, that the power of communion is so uh, dynamic that it will cause any Judas spirit to be revealed and will leave your table or repent. That's the power and the influence of uh, communion. The one preacher I remember uh, said, it's the meal that heals. Now, Jesus faced another situation with one of his disciples. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples but there was one disciple who did not like what he thought he saw. And that was uh, Thomas. Thomas doubted Jesus. Let me just see what somebody's writing here. Hallelujah. Amen. Sounds a little bit better now. Okay. God bless you. Jesus, when Thomas doubted Jesus, when Thomas doubted Jesus, what did Jesus do when Thomas doubted Jesus? Jesus didn't trash him. Jesus didn't react. Jesus said, put your hand right here on the inside of my bosom, my chest. Because once you get in contact, such close contact with Jesus as the living Christ. Something is about to change. And Thomas felt those nail prints. Oh, when you, well, when you disciple people uh, like Jesus, and not just you, me too included, when we disciple people the way Jesus did, we will have far more influence in the lives of others for the kingdom's sake. Thomas pulled out his hand and he confessed, Oh, my Lord, hallelujah. Jesus' uh, way of discipling, Jesus as the Christ was at crossroads. He enters the kitchen of two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Martha invited Jesus in. And instead of sitting at the feet of Jesus, Martha gets so involved with preparations. Preparations. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Jesus is now discipling. Jesus is at the crossroad. 
called anxiety and worries because one of his disciples are now trying to instruct him, of course, that is Martha, Lord, tell Mary to come and help me because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm busy with all this, you know, preparation for you. And Jesus discipled Martha and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. You are concerned about many things. Mary has chosen what is far better. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Jesus as the Christ at crossroads of worries. He did not allow her anxiety or worries to uh, reduce his faith because he is the author and finisher of faith. I'm going to give you another few examples. Are you ready? Jesus disciple people understanding that he was the cancellation of the former to usher in the latter. That means he came as the cancellation of an old, fleshly, legalistic, fallen lifestyle which the first Adam caused, who disobeyed God and exercising his will above the Father. Jesus came with the attitude of restoration and reconciliation. We are all called ministers of reconciliation. I need to restore this individual back to my heavenly father. My purpose is not to fight with people. My purpose is not to focus on the sinful nature. My, because I am the cancellation of that sinful nature. Therefore, I will not be caught up with the accusers who says to that woman in John 8, authorize now that this woman who was caught in the act of adultery needs to be stoned to death. Jesus did not come to stone people with truth, with grace, with mercy. He came to serve people in bringing people up to a higher understanding of accepting his father which he revealed through his lifestyle because Jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father discipling like Jesus takes the humility of a mind that will make himself or yourself of no reputation in considering others above yourself. We must never allow doctrine, our knowledge, to cause us to become puffed up and exalting us with an attitude of superiority. We have authority with humility. Jesus demonstrated his authority with humility. He was from above, he came below, and he considered others above himself. So, having said that, let me just give you another one or two examples or so. Jesus, he, he now talks to his disciples. He says, listen, I, I have to go to Calvary. I'm paraphrasing. The Son of Man will be betrayed and will be killed, flocked, killed. And, but after three days, I will rise again. And he's busy explaining that. And one of his disciples, Peter, objected and stood up and says, No way. Peter must have thought, Simon, we left our fishing business. We left everything to follow you. Now you're going to do a disappearing act? 
and he rebuked Jesus. And Jesus discipled him by discerning the spirit. And he said, get ye behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God. Instead, the, you have in mind the things of your flesh, which is the things of mankind. But he still kept uh, Simon or Peter on the team. Because Jesus knew that his lifestyle was going to be the greatest influence to change people. In fact, Jesus is one of the greatest revolutionaries that have ever walked on planet Earth. He has revolutionized and still the whole world with his lifestyle and his life. Far more than any army put together, any air force put together, any navy being put together, etc., etc., not using any weapon of mass destruction or any such issues, using his lifestyle, his character, the character of Christ, disciple people. It's, you see, the Bible says we cannot give what we do not have. You can only give what you do have. And the gift is only acceptable according to what you have. Amen? Is the time up there? Yep, just about. Uh, let me use another example. Jesus, uh, this very same disciple, Satan came to uh, Jesus and demanded to serve Peter. Why? Because there was strife, strife in the midst or amongst his uh, disciples. Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? And with having strife, Satan had a foothold to sift Peter. Satan came to Jesus, demanded in the American uh, uh, translation, And uh, I was just thinking of different translations there. And Jesus looks at uh, Peter and says, Satan, you know, has demanded to sift you. You will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter said, never, never, never. Jesus said, I have prayed for you. That means you will return, and when you turn back, you're going to strengthen others with what you have come through. Peter objected. And even though that Peter objected, Jesus still served Peter no matter what. You see, Jesus did not take um, accusations, a personal. Jesus knew that anybody who is not under the influence of the Holy Spirit will be very unpredictable. Jesus knew that anybody who does not have a tight relationship with his Heavenly Father through his lifestyle will not always respond, but will react towards the things of God. And Jesus understood not to become caught up with the actual manifestation of negative words, when they called him ranting mad, demon-possessed, drunkard, glutton, he did not get caught up with the words of people, but he discerned the spirit that motivated that speech. And then he understood that if he can, not if he, of course he can, 
re, uh, when when he can heal the problem that's causing the individual to behave like that see that spirit that hurt that disappointment that loss of hope that fear that intimidation that perverted spirit maybe that comes through an individual that uh, rejection that unforgiveness coming through words of bitterness and and he understood if he could just bring hope and heal the need of the individual what need the individual was in need of healing in of their spirit that caused their flesh to spew out such negativity for instance jesus uh, the disciples you know uh, samaria did not want to allow jesus to come in and his disciples said lord do you want us to call down fire from heaven and now, 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 you must understand, these disciples, they were aggressive, some of them. You know that. And so, uh, Jesus, uh, excuse me, I'm paraphrasing, excuse me. With what spirit are you speaking? You see, Jesus understood, as when you disciple people, you've come to give life. You've come to give hope. You've come to release the greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 to 39. The greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God first. Then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. See? The law and the prophets, they depend on these two commandments. In fact, the great commission to go into the world and uh, to make disciples has to flow through the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Once you tap into that love, uh, what kind of love, the ingredients of that love? It says, love is not rude. Love, 1 Corinthians 13, you find it all there. It's a spiritual love. Romans 5, 5, God poured out his spirit, his love by his Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual love. You cannot love people the way Jesus loved people or the way God loves people for God so loved this world. It's a spiritual love. You cannot love that way through the flesh. Because the flesh is, if you're doing good to me, I'll love you. If you agree with me, I'll have unity. If uh, Now, uh, there's got to be agreement. Yes. Now, unity is not just because two people decided... To hold hands. That's not unity. Unity is an attitude of humility in considering the ways of Christ above the feelings and emotions of your own personal expression or life. Unity is to be in sync with God's purpose. Unity is not just 10 people wearing a rope. God bless uh, people wearing ropes. I don't care. I don't have the nail prints of Jesus. So I don't own people. They want to wear a rope. I don't care. Who am I? Who am I? And... So, just because 10 people have got ropes on doesn't mean that there's unity. See, unity is when the brethren dwells together. How? In uh, becoming the corporate son 
through their lifestyle expression, receiving the things of God as the final authority. Unity comes when you allow the word of God to be the referee. Unity comes when you put Christ Jesus and his lifestyle first. Now, having, uh, you know, uh, if you've got five people saying, Amen, that's not unity. That's just simply the power of words coming into agreement. Somebody can say, Amen, but in their heart, they can still reject people. All right. I want to, where's the time? Oh, 30 minutes by the looks over there. Let me explain to you this, or maybe not explain. Jesus came to multiply the bread as the bread of life in people's lives. How? John chapter 6, uh, there's like 5,000 people. Jesus says to his disciples, how will we feed these people? And But the Bible says that he already had in mind what he was about to do. So how, how did that connect with people? At that moment, see, he says to his disciples, how will we feed them? Oh, uh, seven, eight months wages, Philip tried to calculate. And then Andrew, a possibility thinker, brought a boy's lunchbox. Five loaves, two fish. Jesus took the bread. Yes, handed it to his father to bless it. And then... He handed it out and he multiplied the bread and the fish to feed 5,000 people and uh, they came with empty baskets, the 12 disciples, and they, there was so much of leftovers because when, when, when the Holy Spirit manifests Jesus Christ by revelation, there will be more than enough and you will even have leftovers in your basket. Baskets full of leftovers. They picked up 12 baskets full of leftovers. So mentoring is multiplying the bread of life, which is, yes, the Bible, but the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. You want to be an effective Discipler, impart the character of Christ by what you say. Because people will only receive what you have. I always say to folk, you know, someone can stand behind a, a, a pulpit and uh, uh, they can, uh, for instance, uh, talk about a topic of, let's say, uh, uh, mise, uh, let's say they, they talk about a topic of... Uh, uh, how to forgive. But maybe they carry the disease of chickenpox or measles. What will the people catch? Are they going to catch the topic on how to forgive or will they catch the disease that that individual carry? That is why it is so important when you mentor disciple when you impart to be so cautious make sure your spirit is pure holy that there's a righteous impartation people don't need anybody to lay hands on them and impart problems to them because when you lay, that's why Bible also says, do not be hasty to lay hands. And of course, that also goes not to position people uh, hastily into anything. I don't just let anybody lay hands on me. And if they suddenly would do that, and I, I, then I don't want to embarrass them to say, no, excuse me, no. I will say, uh, Father, thank you. I'll whisper it for a righteous impartation, a righteous impartation. All right, I want to close with this uh, 
and that is uh, Philippians 2 uh, verse 5 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Impart to people the Christ in you and avoid trying to impose and tell people what to do, what not to do. Let the Holy Spirit convict people. Let the Holy Spirit convict people. We need the power of the Holy Spirit back. We need the love of God. We need the good news, not bad news. Jesus came to preach the good news, not bad news. Be a good news mentor. And again, I'm just thinking, Jesus always was ready to heal people, to restore people. He was always willing not to condemn people. He was always willing to bring life where there was death. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And then he told the people to uh, untie Lazarus from the grave clothing. You and I are called to untie people. Let's take off the grave clothes that might cause some people to be spiritually dead and bring life to them. I'm going to stop there because there's so much more to say. Hopefully, this will bring life, this impartation today. And remember, you want to be an effective disciple like Jesus? You can only give what you have. That means if you are under a strict discipline or are, are you being discipled yourself, You see, sometimes people want to just disciple others by telling them what they want to, you know, to hear. We need to tell people the truth, but do it with wisdom. Do it uh, with um, a compassion. Do it with an attitude of mercy, an attitude of uh making yourself of no reputation. That means make your doctrine of no reputation. Make your knowledge of no reputation that this is the way, that's da, da, da. All we are called to do is to release the truth in love and let God's Holy Spirit convict people of what is needed. Amen. And never take anything personal in this love you will go through rejection some people will betray you some people will take you to want to try and take you down speak negative whatever whatever keep your focus on what god wants you to do and be the focus of a Christ-centeredness and not a self-centeredness. You're only as effective as what you will allow the Christ in you to rule and reign through you. And remember, lastly, well, it's not the last thing, but be anointed in the Spirit. Look for Luke chapter 4, Jesus in verse, uh, where was it? Verse 18, you'll find it. He says, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. 
when you when you are being anointed and you flow with that love that mercy that grace that compassion you flow with those uh, characteristics of Christ Jesus and disciple people through the character of Christ not by your own standard of how you see things and getting angry because or whatever you know uh, with people who are disappointed or whatever uh, no 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 salvation belongs to God and you and I need to pass on that salvation unto others God bless you, love you, and thank you for watching. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Bye now.